Hi, everyone, and welcome to Technocrime Fighters Forum, episode number 35. I'm here this morning with Dr. Catherine Horton and with um, Karen Melton Stewart. Uh, Millicent, Dr. Melissa Black may indeed join us a little bit later. I'm not entirely certain. Um, and I'm going to turn the floor over um, this morning to Dr. Horton, and she's going to take us through a few campaigns that we've kind of dreamed up and that we think uh, might be great to unleash in the world at this point in time. So, morning, Catherine. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I did brief delay because I quickly tweeted that we're now finally live. And first of all, apologies to everybody who's been waiting for half an hour. For us, we had a big war room meeting. And war room meeting is, is the right word for what we're doing here because we are uh, at war. This is a hot shooting war. And now you maybe uh, notice that the uh, ambience has slightly, uh, ambience has slightly changed because now I have actually uh, metal also above me and around me. Um, the shots have become so absolutely severe. I uploaded two videos onto my YouTube channel where people can see live how I'm being mutilated. And you can also see, but maybe if you look carefully, um, you know, you can just see the injuries in my face. I have to wear absolutely tons of makeup to even look this, uh, you know, like this. Um, you can have a look at the... Um, videos and see what I look like without makeup, how many injuries I have in the forehead, on my heart, and how I am absolutely bruised up to bits. Um, the real truth is that over the last um, couple of weeks, the attacks on us have, the physical attacks have become um, absolutely totally mutilating um, with the clear goal to take us out, with the clear goal of commit premeditated murder by the intelligence agencies. And uh, we are really struggling physically. I, um, I'm not sure, maybe during the filming, you'll hear a couple of loud bangs around me because what they do, um, now that I built a little bunker, I had to build a bunker in my study, is that they cranked up the power and they are machine gunning me with pulsed energy um, projectiles all out so that I receive about, I would say, something like 100 shots into this bunker and a good fraction of them hit my body eventually. And um, it is absolutely impossible to even exist under such circumstances, let alone work efficiently. And this is also the reason why a lot of the projects that people have been waiting for have been delayed. So um, what we decided is that um, for us to be even able to continue helping victims and uh, continue to lead this campaign, we have to survive people, okay? We have to be in some sort of situation where we can just, um, I mean, I, I, by the way, I'm sleeping under my desk. Um, everything, I spend most of my days in this one uh, cubic, two cubic meters here, just to be safe because I'm being machine gunned as soon as I just walk into my kitchen to make myself a cup of tea. So um, we have reached the all out full Nazi genocide state in this um, war. And um, we, we genuinely need help, all of us. Um, now, as I say in the video I made, I think out of um, us five, I'm still the one who is um, best off. My um, colleague, Melanie Richan, had her baby taken away by what I would call malicious criminals at Hospital Erasmus in Brussels, who I, I could put my money on the fact that they might possibly be related to a pedophile ring the way they behaved. Um, that's still under investigation. But anyway, she had her child taken away. Um, she had horrific uh, things done to her that would, I think, knock out every uh, other human being. Um, meanwhile, um, Dr. Millicent Black is being uh, literally physically crippled and mutilated by this psychopathic uh, serial killer, um, Randall Webster from the Air Force. Um, and um, she is now physically in such a bad state. She urgently needs surgery, but it's not even sure if she can have the surgery because this psychopathic degenerate uses her body chips to torture her all the way. And having been in, the, in an operating theater just recently with Melanie and Hospital Erasmus, I can confirm that um, certainly Hospital Erasmus is wired up to trigger body chips and continue the torture all the way into the operating theater. I think that is what is also the situation in many other hospitals. Um, I think what we're dealing with is a huge organized crime architecture that has taken over pretty much every single one of our public institutions, the hospitals, the schools, um, certainly the government and the police, and most certainly the intelligence agencies. But I'm also of the opinion that what you're facing is a systematic targeted genocide of most of the population. This shouldn't come to 
to anybody as a surprise who has um, kind of kept up with Agenda 21 and all the other things. But the truth is that um, as far as we can tell, this, the killing, the mutilation, um, the torture and the intimidation has accelerated massively over the last um, couple of um, months. And certainly the last couple of weeks, um, it has gone absolutely insane. Um, I feel uh, that the entire situation is a bit like when you have <laughs> a lone gun shooter. Let's take that analogy. And um, it's the moment when he goes totally nuts and he just starts screaming and gunning people down uh, completely, uh, you know, without any care. I really very much feel like that that's the stage that our degenerate intelligence agencies and militaries have reached. They are by now gunning absolutely every single person of value down. Anybody who's opposing them is gunned down. I have just last weekend spent my time talking to a whistleblower who is um, a whistleblower about judiciary, um, judicial corruption here in Switzerland. And um, it, it was telling because I, I had to drive my car there. Um, I was gunned to absolutely bits so that I um, a few times almost lost consciousness because of the hard electromagnetic pulses that were shot into my head on the way there. Sitting with him in the restaurant, um, my inner organs were vibrated and microwaved from what I assumed to be a car parked outside, um, probably fitted with these um, Geneva Convention violating weapons produced by Deal and Rheinmetall. And then when I came home, my downstairs neighbor put up some harassment uh, post-it notes. Um, and then when I came into my flat, the, um, I was hit by the smell of fresh uh, acrylic paint. So somebody has been in my home, I suppose, and put something into the walls. And then when I went into my dining room, I noticed that somebody had opened the window wide open and left it like that. So... And yes, and then I came into the study and I noticed that an Ethernet cable had been slit open with a razor. So that's the sort of insanity that we're dealing with. But my point is that I'm talking to this a whistleblower and, um, and he, so what he told me, um, he's been campaigning for a very long time just for people to be able to get justice. And from what he told me, it became very clear that he himself had been attacked several times with um, electromagnetic weapons during his campaigning. So he told me that there was a big campaign when he was distributing leaflets in Switzerland. And lo and behold, that day he had a heart attack. Now, heart attacks have been just, you know, um, happening left, right, and center, deadly car accidents. Um, in a few weeks, I will probably attend the funeral of a, of a lawyer, human rights lawyer, who's been supporting a whistleblower who's magically, spontaneously died in a car accident. Um, yes, so there are, these are too many coincidences, and statistically, one can show that this is pretty much impossible. So the situation we are dealing with now is that our militaries and intelligence agencies have gone proper bonkers. Um, they have completely lost control of themselves. I think if we go through the past um, big genocide and, and um, military takeovers of the, of the world, I think one can plot the military insanity. And um, at some point, um, they reach something that I call all out, you know, full on Nazi. And I think that's where we are now. And I'm not joking people. I think this to the best of my assessment, we're dealing uh, with a situation where we have the Nazi on our, our hands um, and these people are out of control. They will kill at the, at the drop of a hat and they have killed and they continue killing and mutilating and it is pretty impossible to stop these people. I, I think our last chance are really court cases around the world. I firmly believe I, that. I, first of all, that court cases are a way to stop this and I also even more firmly believe that this is the last chance we have to stop this. After that, I have to be honest, to the best of my assessment as a systems analyst, I would say that the only thing that will stop these nutters is uh, a bullet to the head. In other words, all out civil war. And I mean that uh, really in the US and in Europe. Okay, so if people hear us, wherever they are, I want and I think we want them all to take uh, it's seriously and actually understand how very, very serious the situation is. What we're all going through is, is beyond anything that anybody has ever experienced.
in the world, really. I mean, you know, in past wars, there were situations where the army would be in your country, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe they were in your home. But now the enemy is actually literally inside our bodies with remote controllable chips and is even inside our heads with neurotech. Now, the world has not seen anything like that on this scale ever before. Okay, so... Hmm. Plus, uh, you, you can use health weapons. Health weapons. Exactly. Right? right? So, this so is part of why they, they, they can play can with it with and it not be caught at all. And, you know, I think, um, Catherine, what you've pointed to is a very, very important point that I think we should all highlight and emphasize today, how serious the situation is, the extreme gravity of the situation, the extreme urgency of the situation, um, most definitely for all of us on this team and this panel, but also for hundreds and thousands of other people who are being targeted in the USA and in Europe, in countries in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, I guess we focus in the US and Europe because we're sitting here on the, in the Western part of the world, right? Uh, but we do hear from other people as well, from Australia, from New Zealand, uh, from various countries in Asia, etc. So um, I think one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that um, at least this morning, was this interview with uh, Victorious Libertas, this alternative media channel uh, that they had with Robert David Steele, you know, ex-CIA officer. And he made this comment, well, the whole um, interview is titled The Deep State is Toast. And it's, it's, it's very, you know, calming and, and consolatory to, to actually view this. I recommend that everybody watch this today. Uh, but one of the things that he was saying was that literally the, these intelligence agencies are being routed out. A counter coup is an action that Donald Trump is at the head of this coup. I mean, very encouraging stuff to hear. And that 70% of these intelligence agencies are being routed out for being involved literally in crime and a lot of them um, I'm related to child trafficking and to pedophilia so all of that is very good these people you know people like Robert David Steele and others who are working on these issues need to be informed for, by us about what is going on you know with surveillance abuse in the world today because this literally is, is that, that which has led to non-consensual human experimentation from these undercover intelligence agencies. So, you know, I think we should sort of sp uh, spend some time talking about how horrific these attacks are. Yeah. And I, how I, they're being pulled I, off. I'll ask Karen as well for, her, for an update from her and her thoughts on, you know, the situation itself, the actual situation on the ground right now. Well, I I warned these ladies this morning. I said I am just basically in a in a uh, state of high dudgeon. I'm just furious. I'm I'm very angry. I'm trying to to keep civil, um, but uh, just several things have have just really ticked me off. I mean, I my household has been under sonic attacks since at least late July, early August. I've lost one of my cats to it. I have a favorite dog who's dying from the lung damage that Sonics do to you. Um, there have been nights I didn't know if I would survive. And I have sent messages to the police here trying to tell them what's going on, and I'm ignored. Um, uh, and I think, um, I don't know, I may, I may want to say a couple things. Um, I am involved in two lawsuits right now. There was one that I fire, filed against the National Security Agency, and it was accepted by the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in 2010 and sat on the shelf until recently. So it sat on the shelf for seven years. And I think, I suspect, that NSA told the EEOC judge uh, to just sit on it so that they could have a chance to kill me. So they have not quite managed to do so. So what they've done is said, okay, well, we've managed to get her in trouble in Florida. So now's the time to come after her with the EEOC case because she spent all of her money trying to defend herself against false accusations in Florida. So now we're going to have the judge bring the court case off the shelf so she can lose because she can't pay for it. Well, let me tell you what that court case with the EEOC would prove, okay? It is a solid tie to gang stalking, slander, and now to the use 
of directed energy weapons on the civilian population by the federal government, by NSA specifically, but by the federal government itself. So this is a direct concrete tie if I can win it. Okay, now the second lawsuit, as I just uh, mentioned, in Florida has to do with the state of Florida coming after me for what I call felonious self-defense. All right, in the state of Florida, they pride themselves on the fact that they have a law that is called the stand your ground law. This means that you have the right to defend yourself against an attacker on your own property in Florida and that you do not have to retreat, run away, leave your property, or go hide in your house from an attacker, which only makes sense, you know. However, in Tallahassee, Florida, the home of the consummate dirtbag Hicks, they um, decided that after stalking and harassing me with InfraGuard retards, that they weren't being able to kill me because I was shielding well enough to survive. So they would go ahead, ahead and send the son of a retired uh, Leon County Sheriff's Department woman to my house to ring the doorbell, hide, and then jump me and attack me. And I keep getting uh, told by a, uh, a friend to say, the guy hit me with such force that he split my upper lip clean through. Okay, now I have a right to defend myself. I did. The, he, he left. He was forced away. He went home, called the sheriff's department because he, his mommy used to work there and he has a sister still there who had come to the house two weeks before the attack to tell me to quit trying to report her brother for harassment because they had family. She uh, basically was employed by the Leon County Sheriff's Department. And they would never press charges against family. That they could do anything they wanted to me and get away with it because they were part of the Leon County Sheriff's Department family. Okay? So this tells you what happened, what happened when I called the Sheriff's Department. They sent a woman out to speak to me. I told her what happened. A woman deputy sent a male to go speak to him. And the two deputies came back to my house and said they were there to arrest him. They had been dispatched to arrest him. Then two sheriff's deputy supervisors came out and talked to them and said, no, we're not arresting him. And as I went to get my mother, who had witnessed the attack, you know, she said she, she, said she was able to tell them that, yes, I heard him coming at my daughter, yelling curses at her, threats at her, and then, you know, I heard the exchange and then she comes up the driveway and she's bloody. She's got blood all over her face and all over her shirt. So she didn't see it, but she heard it. He got out of his car. He had parked his car somewhere that you couldn't see it, came and rang the doorbell. Then when I came outside to see who was there, then he leaves his car and jumps me. All right. He's left his car with fists clenched cursing and yelling at me and attacks me, okay? So at that point, we've got the sheriffs uh, there at the home and the one supervisor, when I went to get my mother, bring her out so she could repeat to him what she had heard because uh, he was making noises like he, he didn't believe me. Like I would have something better, you know, nothing better to do than engage with morons, okay? So I bring her out and he's telling the female deputy we're not going to arrest Renee's son. We're going to say that he came over for a nice neighborly visit and Stuart just attacked him for no reason. And the female deputy looked back at me absolutely, totally horrified and ashamed. You could see on her face it was red. You could see that she knew that wrong was being done. And, but she couldn't do anything about it because she was just a deputy. So my mother did come out and repeat to him, and he said, well, I, you know, basically, I'm not going to uh, take that into, into consideration. And he alluded to the fact that she's old. Really? An 86-year-old mother, uh, basically a woman, but she doesn't count because she's old. Or maybe she doesn't count because she's a woman, just like my complaints didn't count because I was a woman. 
you know. And I actually said to a deputy, I explained and explained, and I sent them all kinds of information uh, concerning these weapons. I sent them information about um, what I had done for almost 30 years and got totally disrespected. And at one point in time, I did tell a deputy, I said, I've sent you every bit of proof that's possible to send you. You know, I've, <laughs> I've done a job that required a lot more education than what you have. I said, and is your position basically that you can't possibly believe me because I don't have a penis? So I am not happy with those scumbags, you know. Um, but the lawsuit, you know, they, it, it continued and they tried to say that um, defending myself was assault with a, with a deadly weapon. Well, what is a deadly weapon? At the time, I happened to be loading my car to return to Florida, I mean to return to Maryland, um, because I'd had it with the Florida scumbags. And I had um, something in my hands to put in my car. One thing was a flashlight. Well, the guy comes at me, he rushes me. Well, what am I going to use? My fists, I have a petite um, bone structure. I'm sorry, but he's half my age, twice my size. So yes, when he tried to hit me, then I uh, hit him back with the flashlight. But that's a deadly weapon. I'm supposed to use these on a mo monster that actually had been climbing our fence for weeks and was so big, he was bending the fence and, and damaging it. But w I, had, I had reported that to the sheriff's department and they did nothing, nothing. They had on record that we'd reported him over and over and over and over again and did nothing. And so now they're surprised that it has come to this. Well, they know, they know it's, you know, it was no surprise, but they're acting like it. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that they sent him because they were so frustrated and they saw me packing the car to leave and they said, well, shoot, we're not gonna get the kill bonus if she leaves. You know, so um, they arrested me, took me to jail, and I spent 24 hours there and got bailed out, spent another 24 hours at home with my parents because I go to see them six months, seven months a year. Um, and then I was looking around for a lawyer when they came to arrest me again. And I said, what for? And they wouldn't tell me till they got me into the Leon County Jail. And there I learned that I was being <laughs> arrested for cyber stalking. Really? With what computer? Because I had been hit with um, the directed energy weapons for months and I had put away the only computer that I had into a storage unit. And what was this cyber stalking? Now, this is ironic because the neighbors around who were engaged in harassment were very clearly cyber stalking me because if I would come inside or in, in the house or out of the house, they'd make beeping noises or they would you know, do things to show that they were watching. They knew exactly when I came and left and that is cyber stalking. However, the detective Paul Salvo, the anti-genius, decided that a um, trail camera that, that was up in a tree on our property that was face the, facing the fence that was being damaged continuously, that that was cyber stalking. Well, let me explain to you what a, what a trail camera is. It is a camera that is put on a trail in the woods to see where deer and other game might be, be gathering so that hunters can say, oh, this is a good place to hunt. It has a chip in it that's a memory chip and you take it out of the camera and you put it in a computer to see were there deer last night, okay? You cannot connect to the internet with this type of static camera. It is motion activated only. So what happened is that the, you know, a few of the branches may have blown and activated the motion camera. So the only film on there was of the fence. But this genius, this genius detective, and God help us, because that's supposed to be a, a higher level in intellect than the mere deputies, and you can tell that that's a problem. Um, he decided that a static camera was cyber stalking, and I was in jail for a week before the lawyer my husband found uh, for me got me out on bail. So in essence, he lied. Not only did they lie about the assault, but they added to it by lying and the Florida judges were so stupid 
as to not question that and just run with it. Now, my lawyer did get me out on bail. And she said, well, how about if she goes back to Maryland where her husband is? You know, because otherwise I would have sat in jail waiting for a hearing on bogus charges for over a year because the Leon County Sheriff's Department is full of liars. And so, like I said, I'm angry and you can tell. So um, the dist assistant district attorney, Lorena Volrath Bueno, basically bragged to my lawyer, my defense lawyer, I can put her away for 15 years. She's crazy. She thinks that directed energy weapons exist. And so my lawyer said, well, she has sent you, she sent the sheriff's department and me loads of literature showing they do exist. But you're saying in your opinion that she's crazy. One, she's got two independent psychologists who say there's nothing wrong with her. Three, you had her talk to a jailhouse psychologist who said there's nothing wrong with her um and i think there was a fourth but you're saying because you an assistant direct uh assistant direct um what is it called district attorney don't understand about this technology that you in your infinite wisdom have decided she's crazy and that high school educated deputies who basically are as corrupt as can be have decided to call her crazy that your opinion matters more than the opinion of four professional psychologists. So she's basically ground in and she wants to, to put me away for 15 years, which would bring me out of jail at about seven, age 75. So you could, be, you could argue that the state of Florida wants to put me in prison for the rest of my life for not allowing myself to be beaten up by a thug who... His record is full of substance abuse and battery. He, and they had um, talked about a restraining order, and I couldn't even go see my parents because they live too close to the real perpetrator. And so my lawyer asked, they said, well, to make sure that she doesn't go anywhere near him, where does he work? Oh, he doesn't. Really? A 30-something-year-old man doesn't work. Well, where is he getting his money? Maybe uh, perping, maybe setting up a uh, directed energy weapon, uh, running off of his car aimed at my parents' house that's downhill from him. And the meters, the meters I was using showed that when his car was there, the meters were off the charts. When his car was not there, they were normal. But no, the Leon County Sheriff's Department couldn't be bothered to look at the meters because they didn't know what they were. They couldn't be bothered to go to the physics department in town that was part of the Florida State University. They couldn't be bothered to talk to a physicist. And they couldn't be bothered to go to what is the National Electromagnetics Lab in Tallahassee, Florida, that was uniquely qualified to tell them what that meter meant. And they also could not be bothered to go to the Fusion Center Forensics Unit who said they would be glad to help, but they had to have the request of the deputies of the sheriff to do anything for me, but they couldn't be bothered to ask them to. So now my lawyer, of course, is saying, You've, you're basically persecuting a woman who was trying to get help, went through every single proper channel and was rebuffed. And now she has somebody who comes to her home to try to beat the crap out of her. And she dares defend herself. And you want to put her away for 15 years. What sense does that make? And the woman won't, she won't negotiate. And I will tell you that one of the psychologists who judged me absolutely, totally fit knows her and offered to talk to her. And she is, um, this lady is the one who wrote me one of the psychological reviews saying there's nothing wrong with her. Not only is she a victim, but in my, um, in researching this, I found that there are many other victims like her who are being ignored and being maligned maliciously and for nothing. Now, she had actually worked with Lorena Volrath Bueno on a case. And so she knew this woman was a good quality psychologist, 
But when this woman approached her to talk to her about the case, she refused to talk to her. She absolutely refused to talk to her. My opinion is that Lorena Volwath Bueno is a deep state whore who's been paid to persecute me, not prosecute, persecute. And I think she, and most likely Angela Dempsey, who is the supposed judge in the matter, and both of which are considered to be people who don't care about law, all they care about is filling prisons because it brings money to the private owners of the prisons, that they both are deep state whores who are being paid under the table to try to put me away. So not only is this, this is you know, obviously important because I don't want to die in prison and um, I'm sure they have that planned. But if I can beat these people, then I can show local corruption, fusion state corruption, infraguard corruption, um, judicial system corruption, and I can come out swinging and expose this. And not, and not only for that, but the ridiculousness on the surface of a, of a woman who was at the time 60 years old being attacked on her own property by a man in his 30s against whom she had filed multiple complaints for months and then be told it's not legal for you to defend yourself in the state that prides itself on being the stand your ground uh, law state is ludicrous. That means that these people are bending and twisting and perverting laws at their whim in order to destroy people. So, like I said, if I can prevail in either of these cases or both, then I think it gives all of us a sledgehammer. Now, are there other people who need help too? Yes, absolutely there are. But we have to think and judge what are the cases that will be our sledgehammers that will pound through the barriers that they're putting up. And then when we've pounded through and opened up, then all the other cases can come through that door once we prove it. So, like I said, that's my, that's my dilemma right now. Um, there is yet another pretrial continuance um, in December. And this Lorena, uh, Lorena um, Volrath Bueno, and I will repeat, one of her relatives was helping Infragard harass harm and attempt to murder me. So tell me that she should be on this case. No, she should not. She should recuse herself, but she will not. Why? Because she's corrupt. Again, a deep state whore. So like I said, I'm mad. I am just beyond, beyond civil, beyond diplomatic. I'm facing the scum of the earth. And, but I am hoping you know, that um, if I prevail, it's a sledgehammer for all of us. And um, that, that'll be telling in the next few weeks. That'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, it's going to be tough. Like I said, I had a um, retainer with the EEOC lawyer that got used up reporting all of the vicious attacks on me in Florida by the Fusion Center by the InfraGuard scumbags of Tallahassee. So I'm having to kind of just send the lawyer what I can, you know, so, and now I'm sustaining two lawsuits. So um, we'll have to see. And then um, unfortunately, some of you know that the directed energy weapons also have caused cancer, not only in the cat that I lost in August, um, but in my dog. And so he is, getting homeopathic because there's just no money for anything else. So I am doing the best that I can. And if, if people want to help, that's wonderful. If people say I can't, then I understand. Believe me, because I'm there. But uh, if there are people who do have the means to help all of us, then I, and, you know, I've said that you have a right, if you can help, to say, let's say um, I put $10,000 down for a retainer and you win your case. I want that 10 off the top. You should have that 10 off the top. 
if you can do it, you know. Um, but we do need help, or maybe the whole the whole thing sinks. But um, there are some people with potentially wonderful lawsuits, like Millicent Black, Sherry Guaneri in New Mexico. They have powerhouse potential for their lawsuits. So people need to review and see where they want to put their efforts. Maybe say maybe money. You know, if everybody chipped in ten dollars. You know, that would help a lot, I think, because look at all the people who are victims. But if everybody chipped in their time to send emails to tell these roaches that you're no longer hidden in the dark, we see you, we know who you are, and we will be holding you accountable, that would help tremendously too. So guys, now is the time to do it. It's now or never. Um, if things go badly for me, um, I may be in prison next year. And I may be in prison for a very long time in the corrupt and hopelessly corrupt state of Florida. So, you know, there's my appeal. And like I said, you don't have to help me. You can help anybody else. Just pick out some cases and help as a family, as a unit. Because if you have three people pounding on a door, you're just going to be making noise. Okay, if you have a hundred people pounding and pushing on that door, that door's going to open. It's going to fall, and everybody's going to go through that entrance. So think about that. Thank you guys very much. Karen, thank you so much for that whole story. What an extraordinary story. And as you know, many of us, well, some of us have known of it for quite a while, and we refrained from speaking publicly about it until you give us the go ahead. So at this very point, you know, at this juncture, I should probably okay to publish your story at this point, because you've, you know, touched on it publicly. And if it is, let's talk later. And I will put an article out, you know, just like Melanie's case, sit on your case, we need to underline and emphasize the absolute injustice of these charges. These the absolute horror you know, and, and let's do it. I'm very happy to, to cover this and we should cover it immediately because that might be one way of um, corralling resources and shining a flashlight, corrupt jokers out there in Florida and letting them know to see what's going on here, even as they are covered up. Well, I mean, one of the things, if I, if I win and this is dropped, I can go after the assistant DA for malicious prosecution. And her career and her hopes to be a judge are over. Which I think anybody who bends to the deep state to corrupt the Constitution and corrupt the law needs to be removed. She can be a dog catcher. Of course, I wouldn't really actually wish that on the dogs, but you know what I'm saying. She can be a janitor somewhere. It's horrifying. You know, this kind of corruption absolutely needs to be routed out. And this is the way to do it. I think this is the way to do it. Become public about it. Appeal to others. Have others working with us to help you to bring this to the fore. And, you know, let these people know with their names attached of corruption and injustice, they're not going to go unremarked in the public eye. I hope not. We need to expose them all. And I have had people write to Pam Bondi, the Florida State Attorney General. And at this point in time, she would look like uh, she appears to be a, um, a hand puppet that has, serves no purpose whatsoever. Yes, and you'd sent on a wonderful letter to Pam Bondi, which I hope to feature on my site shortly, because I think you had recommended that other people write to their own attorney generals, right, along the same lines, and just kind of personalize the letter, use your letter as a sort of template and personalize it for their purposes and for their particular targeting experiences. Uh, yes, and, you know, I still hope that it's useful somewhere. Now, even though she's extraordinarily reticent to actually do her job um it leaves an electronic paper trail and then we talk liability absolutely yeah i i think what people have to understand is um 
what we have here um, in the team, um, you know, the, 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 the people who got together uh, on this joint investigation team, we all have court cases, either past court cases or court cases in the pipeline. And um, we kind of unified and got together precisely because our, our cases touched on the key issues. And um, I think people need to um, realize, so we, I, we are all aware that there are thousands and thousands of victims, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to actually help every single last victim. However, one of the things that's also true is that not all the victims have, first of all, the same level of evidence and the same uh, level of, well, how to say, um, it's not even connectedness in, in who you know, because if we knew that powerful people would get us out, they would have gotten us out. No, it's about um, how are we connected into the system and, and what a great impact would, would these cases have. You know, because there are some people who are harassed and stalked by fringe people, and there are some people like Karen who are being stalked by and, and also harassed and have, um, if we, if we um, you know, put the ev evidence together, very likely put literally death money on her, um, on her name and signed it. And I'm talking about fraudulent life insurances and, and, and. Um, and these people are very high up. So if you want to really um, rid the, the country of organized crime and this deep state network, you have to hit at the root. And Karen's case goes right to the top of the NSA. In, in every single way. And then there are these tentacles and the actual court cases here are almost about the noise made by the deep state, you know? Um, but actually this case goes right to the heart of the matter. And it's, as Karen said in the beginning, this goes right um, to the core, which is that the federal government is killing its, its own people in a, in a premeditated systematic way. And the NSA is involved and, and all the other alphabet agencies are involved, but Karen's case goes to the core. And um, people also need to understand that um, what we're doing here is we're trying to recapture our systems from the criminals. We need an intelligence agency. We need a police. We need a judiciary. But right now, all these institutions are wholesale owned by the criminals. So we need it back. And one way to get it back is to just, you know, well, what people tend to do, and I think this is a human error, it's a natural response, is to just give up on these things and say, oh, yes, the police is corrupt. Well, you know, if the police is corrupt, they've got all the guns and eventually they will come to your house and not just um, attack you with fists, but just gun you down in your own home. Now, in my case, that's already happening. They just don't shoot with bullets. They are gunning me 24-7 in my own home, in my own bed, in my own shower. They are gunning me down. Now, that is what it looks like when your police is owned by the criminals. This is the Swiss police, okay, the Swiss intelligence agency. And in America, you're already there, you know, because what Karen is also saying is that she's being gunned down and her pets are being gunned down in her own home with cancer weapons, with sonic weapons, with electromagnetic weapons. So we are fighting a, a big war. It's actually, well, not quite a civil war. This is a governmental war on its own population. And if you want to win this war, which I tell you we must, you have to support the cases which go right to the root, you know? And actually, one of the things I would like to do is, um, I think when we are putting out appeals um, for people to help us, I think there are lots and lots of people who want to help. They, don't, they just don't know how. So here's a, um, a list of things, um, how you can help us. Number one is we absolutely need money and we need funds. We really, really do. And um, what most people do is that they shy away from donating because they are embarrassed to just donate $5 or ten dollars but please don't be because if you all just changed your mindset and thought well this is now the last stand um, for defending our countries and we can do it most effectively through these court cases that go right to the root of the matter then suddenly ten dollars or five dollars seems like a pretty good investment you know it's like two coffees at starbucks are you willing to invest that in somebody who's fighting for your country well if you can please do now rather than next week or forget about it and um, one of the things i would like to um, point people to is if i may just share my screen if you go to my website which is stop 007.org and you scroll down so there are some announcements here at the top but if you go down here to the different sections, there's this prominent um, area called Support Our Fighters, and you will find all the members of the Joint Investigation Team down here with donate buttons. So um, here's Karen, and here's her donate button. It goes straight to her account, 
and really really please what you can do right now is either donate you know to the people who you want to support support his um dr melissa black ramola uh, myself but also melanie and her human rights charity either support the people who um, you want to support or support support us all at the same time either way but please also um, use your network of people of high integrity reach out and ask them specifically to donate here okay please so this is absolutely urgent people because we need the money now and we absolutely need also everybody's network to be mobilized to help us you know you need to amplify what you are doing um, so please support us financially and as Karen said, you can support us many other ways. Um, if you don't have the finances, perhaps you have the time. Um, and, um, you know, if you can support us with your time and effort, that's also worth gold. And one of the things we want to start is that this Sunday, by Sunday, we want to put together um, campaign letters um, that we can send for us and campaign for targeting against us to be stopped. And um, we know that there are many, many other victims, and we ask them to take part in this and also add their name to these campaign emails at the end. So we had already an email campaign at the start of the year, which was the tsunami email campaign. It was cut short exactly at half time. We were contacting all countries of the world, and, in, and we were in the process of informing them about targeting. And um, I suspect that this campaign was so successful that they had to assault us until we stopped. So the campaign was stopped because, um, you know, I was um, doing a, a quite a bit of it. And unfortunately, the physical attacks on me were so severe, I just couldn't go on anymore. And the attacks got better as soon as we stopped. So this was Swiss Intel basically gunning me down until I stopped. But um, one of the things I want to say is that the tsunami email campaign is going to come back, but we are waiting to, to start um, some court cases and to get information together to make it even more hard hitting. But the campaign is coming back. We just have so many other things to do in the meantime. But before the tsunami email campaign starts, we urgently need a personalized campaign for our own safety and our own survival and our own court cases, exactly as Karen said, to break through the dam and to then basically open up the floodgates for all the other court cases. And we ask you to please, you know, join us in supporting us because we have so much evidence, because our cases go so to the root, you know, and also because we do have the stamina and are in the position to fight this, you know. Very few people are in a similar position. And if you think that you have got a, um, you know, a court case that's already, you know, ready to go and you've got the energy and um, everything that you need, then please join us, you know, go public and please join us as, as some of the um, court cases that will just, you know, hit the system first. But we need absolutely everybody to, to just join us right now because this is a key time. And I think Karen also pointed at a very, very important thing, which is these people try to kill us before we get to court. Okay. And that's what this is about. The idea is that we die of cancer, heart, you know, heart disease, a heart attack, a stroke or a car accident or whatever these people might dream up next before we can get into court. Because um, as Dr. Melissa Black also says, as soon as you submit something um, to a court, it becomes an official record. Okay. And it already means a lot to society when the information we have is actually submitted to a judge. Even that act of submitting it as an official document or as, an, as a, a notarized affidavit is worth a lot, you know? And, and we absolutely have to move now. And I'm also telling everybody, um, we are painfully aware that there are thousands of other victims and they are physically also tortured within an inch of their life. And many people have already been murdered. We are aware of that. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's also for that reason that we're absolutely frantic now and we're saying we have to get to court as quickly as possible. You know, we have to start um, going up against these people because there are people, you know, out there and many of them who are even worse off than us, physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically, everything, you know. So guys, um, Christmas is coming up, you know. And every single time you go into the shops, if the American shops are any, anything like the European shops, by now you will have all the Christmas decoration and all that. And then please, every single time you see a chocolate Santa Claus, 
just think what Christmas is about, what it stands for um, in, in the West, and, and also think that if we, are, if we are worth our salt as a Western civilization, we have to stop this criminality by Christmas. This Christmas has to be the first Christmas in, I think, decades when nobody gets tortured by their own government in the West. You know, maybe it will be the first since the 19, what, 1940s, 50s was the single year when, you know, people weren't tortured by the, the psychopaths in our own government. You know, and so Karen, for Karen, it's extremely urgent. I ask you to please, please donate. And also, again, either donate, no matter how little, please just do it, you know, um, or else, if you can't, please start campaigning and reach out to your network and ask people to give money. Because, guys, this is the last stand. And I'm telling you, we either hit these court cases ASAP or we are all toast. Pretty much literally. Because to the best of my assessment, and maybe my colleagues will agree, what we are faced with is an integrated, pretty perfected weapon system that can kill at the speed of light. All right? And this is global. Um, I am of the opinion that every single um, cell tower that has been put up, certainly the newest models, are actually covert weapons, kill weapons, um, that have other functions. If you turn down the power, yes, they can send your text messages and broadcast YouTube videos of, you know, happy kittens. But if you crank up the power or turn it maybe into a pulse, these things can shoot through your head and you will drop dead instantly. Okay? I'm pretty sure of that. And they can shoot through your heart, uh, you know, and you can combine towers and, and shoot at you with oomph that is just focused on you and not hit the next person next to you. And just this week, you know, in this war, I also would like to say a couple more things. Uh, this is a war, people. And the first thing that happens in a war is that the enemy tries to um, disrupt communication channels, which is actually the most important thing in a war, you know, after the weapons and the manpower. Now, one of the things that I've blown the whistle on this week is what Twitter does, um, which is a form of shadow banning. And shadow banning is a nice fluffy name for um, information warfare. Okay, so one of the things I would like to say to you guys is that in this war, they will um, disrupt our communication channels. My gut feeling is I, I raised the alarm with my colleagues, um, you know, the past week because I'm pretty convinced that... Um, well, if, if Robert Steele is right and the deep state is up against the wall, I think they will have a last stand and it will involve a pretty big showdown, okay? I don't think the biggest crime cartel on the, panel, uh, on the planet is going to go quietly. So whatever's going to happen, you know, things will get much worse before they get better and what these people have is also an internet kill switch, okay? So they can take down all communication channels, they can uh, pretty much take down the electricity system instantly. Um, you know, the, the electricity systems we have in America and Europe are literally set up for um, pretty much self-triggering non-linearity if you're not careful. Okay, so um, these people can unleash massive havoc. They can also um, pull the, the plug on the monetary system by just not doing what they're doing, which is keep this afloat. The entire monetary system now is like a big juggling act. If high power computers do not do the, um, the bogus tricking and keeping things afloat that they do, our world will look very different by lunchtime. It will literally be Argentina by midday. Um, so I think everybody knows what that means. Now, how do we act in a situation like that? So uh, as I think Catherine Austin Fitz said, there is, uh, we can do this nicely, you know, or we can do it the rough way. Um, the rough way would be exactly that, you know, the, the deep state um, is cornered. They will start um, pulling the plug on the monetary system, setting off um, pretty much havoc everywhere, pull the plug on the electricity system, poison the water system, and start shooting with their microwave weapons that they have literally on almost every rooftop and in church towers, which is the cell phone um, system. And I think as far as they are concerned, that's the plan. You know, that is literally the plan, because as I keep saying, these people are nuts. They are pretty fucked in the head and they are willing to go to all that. And I'm not even mentioning all the bio warfare that they can unleash. So um, that's what we are set up to. So it is basically we're on, I think, as far as the world is concerned, certainly the Western world. And I think if we go down, we'll um, pull the rest with us. 
we are on one big Boeing 747 where it turned out that the pilots are totally fucked in the head. It's a bit like that scene from Wolf of Wall Street. If you haven't seen it yet, please do because it's a documentary. It's when everybody on the plane is having a big, uh, you know, they are all on drugs, they're all having sex and they're all totally out of it and they don't notice that the plane might just actually hit the ground. Now it's, now it's like that, but even worse because our pilots are totally nuts. They have gone totally off the rail. They are actually actively leading the plane towards the ground and the engines are fucked too. Okay, in plain English, that's the situation we're in. So what you can see now and what my team is and what many, many other people behind the scenes are doing is first of all, try to pull the pilots away from the steering. Yes, as quickly as possible. And at the same time, we have to repair the engines whilst we're almost in free fall. And that's the best way I can describe our situation and the urgency that we're dealing with. Okay, so this is it, guys. So we either... So the other side wants us all to die. And that's why they put out all these plans for two thirds of us to die because, hey, that's the plan. Okay. If they think if two thirds of us die, it's, uh, you know, it's not, not a bad thing. And it has to be said that the people who came up with these plans by now, they're a bit old, you know, and you know what really old people are like in their 90s, they get a bit grumpy. And I can understand the sentiment. You know, if you if you walk down, say, Oxford Street in London on a Saturday afternoon, you might come to the conclusion that if two thirds of the people die, it's a good thing. I was there, you know, in Oxford Street on a Saturday afternoon. But What's the problem with that sort of thinking? And there's actually a very, very sophisticated mathematical systems analysis reason why this doesn't work. And it's because every single system that we have is far too complex for two thirds of us to die and still function. Okay. Now, absolutely everything people didn't notice, but over the last 50 years, everything we have, not just the computers in front of us, but also the kettles and also the plastic and the materials that we're using have become ever more complex and are reliant on a highly sophisticated, massive supply chain. If you kill two thirds of the people, you kill off expertise, niche expertise. That is things like, how do I make a specific mix of plastic, you know, and, and other things to, to, make our world work um we i think as a you know as a systems analyst i have to say we can't kill two-thirds of the people or we all die literally that's that's ultimately why but i don't think these people see it like that because they're not exactly systems analysts you know they're not really exactly as karen indicated their top qualification for the job it turns out is that they are nuts you know they are psychopathic serial killers and they are sadistic pedophiles that's their top qualification for the job okay so and they will you know, you know catherine with that with that analogy of the of the aircraft it's really interesting because if you look at the entire ti world over there it's like somebody jumps up in that aircraft to say oh look i think the pilot is kind of steering us downward not onward or upward we <laughs> get shot with a radiation weapon and that's what's going on that is exactly what's going on with the radiation weapon like almost all of us experienced is in the overhead lockers they are all rigged the overhead lockers are rigged so that you die instantly if you say something yeah and people are saying don't say it because that makes it happen no you know <laughs> la 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 you know i mean we're we're perfectly fine with a crashing airplane because we have fingers to put in our ears and we can say la 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 you know and that's what we're dealing with you know sheeple public and uh cowards and and, and then you have right and then you have the media mainstream media also on the plane also heading toward you know an inevitable crash Who's, who are trying to stop the people speaking out and trying to hush and shush everyone and say, oh, no, it's okay, don't worry, just don't look down, don't look out of the window. Keep exactly. doing whatever you're doing. Yeah. I think the, media, yeah. Yeah, the people who, are, who go on to the intercom, you know, in the, in the cabin and make these cabin announcements, in-flight announcements, and I think, you know, they are saying, oh, well, you know, it's just turbulence. It's not actually that we're in free fall that you feel a bit funny, you know, <laughs> approaching free fall. No, no, it's just turbulence. It's all fine. We're, you know, at cruising altitude. It's all fine. And then I think another very nice analogy is, you know, these little screens that you have in the back of the seat where you can just watch the newest movies. Um, but it's just like that. Those are our little 
TVs and as long as you just watch the movie and ignore the turbulence, everything will be fine. The truth is nothing is fine, okay? And I think there are people who are desperately trying to pull the pilots away and these pilots are not just on drugs and drunk, but they're also, you know, by birth, pretty messed in the head. So they are beyond redemption. And, um, you know, the truth is we have to put new pilots there very quickly um, but the pilots keep dying on the way to the front of the airplane. And at the same time, as I also said, there are, there's very, very sophisticated, uh, highly complex damage to the engine. You know, and there are some experts who are very quiet and we don't hear them because they are now trying to repair the electronics and the, the actual structure of the plane. And they're trying to do it with pretty much, you know, um, a pen, you know, and, uh, and a rubber band. <laughs> and the rubber bands, you know, some people yeah. have some rubber bands left, exactly. And that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Um, well, you know what people say? They say flying's not dangerous. Flying's not dangerous. Look at the statistics. Flying's not dangerous. And we're saying, yeah, but crashing is. <laughs> exactly. Look, look at the statistics. Very few people survive the crash. <laughs> exactly. Yep. That's the- well, you know, I have to say, in um, in that conversation I heard uh, that Robert David Steele had with the Victorious Libertas guys, one of the things he said was that he's become very good friends with, um, with somebody we all know, Bill Binney, William Binney, the NSA whistleblower, who is at this point in time, you know, heading up a survey um, for those who are targeted worldwide and examining evidence. Uh, that people are bringing forward. So that's, you know, a very good sign for all of us. Um, So apparently one of the things that uh, Bill Binney has conveyed to, um, to, I guess, Donald Trump's team, right, Um, is that um, the NSA has actually been collecting data and it has all the data. It actually has all the emails emails, text messages, communications of every kind from people going back for at least 10 years, if not more. And so with that information now, everything in association with these horrific pedophile rings and child trafficking rings, et cetera, is all going to come out. So, you know, it's a good sign. So the, the plane crash, in other words, is actually being investigated as we speak. Just thought I'd throw it in there. It's some, something to look forward to. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, but I think what it's, um, it's like, it's pretty much like the black box, you know, in, uh, in, uh, on a plane. So the big data stream that all of us are generating 24 seven, the other side generates as much as we do, um, you know, uh, that's, it all goes into the black box, which could be Bluffdale and all these other sites, you know, around the world that are like Bluffdale. Um, yeah. Um, it's just that, you know, you, 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 famously you can't get at the black box you know whilst you're in flight and approaching a crash and i think that's also true here because the people who control bluffdale and other facilities and who are collecting the data well um you know they are kind of the other side so it's a bit like the stasi archives you know the stasi when it got dissolved they they panicked and they started shredding their data and i think something similar will happen here as well by the way I mean, in the end, they didn't manage and people reconstructed partially this, the Stasi archives over, over many years. And it's a bit like that. Um, but it's true. Everything about these crimes to the criminals are, are already in the database. It's clear as day. I think you don't even need to run, you know, um, anything as sophisticated as thin thread over that to find out who the criminals are. I think you can do much, uh, you know, uh, much simpler methods that I used to use in particle physics and find <laughs> reliably some criminals because they're so freaking obvious. But, um, you know, anyway, the, the, the real issue is we can't, we can't access the black, uh, the black box right now we can't we can't get into bluffdale i wish we could but we can't um if there are people already accessing the black box who are on our our side great guys keep going but um you know we can't hold our breath waiting for that um what we have to do is we have to figure out what is happening mid-flight and we have to figure it out with all the things that we have at our disposition you know and um, I, I can't explain to you how very, very important it is. And um, there are um, reasons why, I, sorry, I think I keep getting feedback. I'm not sure. Karen, is it your microphone? I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm being, I get this hissing sound very, very loud on my end. Um, I, um, well, how to put it? There are many, many, many systems that are tremendously, um, some people say with beyond repair, messed up. 
And, um, you know, in one of my earlier videos that I did before Techno Crime Fighters, I was trying to explain what they are. Um, the financial system is certainly one of them. And there are people who are working on repairing the financial system and get rid of the fraud and then do a currency reset and put our money onto a gold backed, you know, actual um, precious metal backed solid foundation once and for all. So th those efforts are going on. And they are what I call civilian generals that are leading the effort and fighting. And one of them on, in that particular project is Karen Hudas. Then there's other projects too, um, also massively important, which is to get the trillions back that are missing from the US budget. And by the way, also are missing from um, places like the EU. So there was um, a guy um, called Edward Hull who went under the name of Christopher Story, and um, he um, gave a talk quite famously, it's on, on the internet, um, and I think it's called EU Corruption, and he explains how the, um, the accounts of the European Commission haven't been um, signed off by their own um, uh, panel of accountants for the last 15 years because of the fraud. So if you, if you had to guess how much money went missing there, I think, um, you know, I, if I had to guess, I would say it's roughly the same order of magnitude as what went missing in the US. Now, the question is, where does the money go? And I would say, some people say it goes into funding a parallel civilization, and then they philosophize about, oh, it could be underground bunkers on Mars or something. I suspect this is funding the parallel um, civilization of parasitic criminals, that we have all around us. I think these people are around us. Now, when you're being taken over by organized crime and you're being murdered by organized crime, uh, you have to, um, you know, drain the swamp, cut the money flow. Um, and, and because of that, we also have to find and get back these missing trillions if we want this weapon system and the criminals shut down. So you have to understand that fighting the weapon system and having it shut down is pretty much impossible without um, you know, getting the trillions back. Uh, and it will be impossible without having a currency reset and, and you know, switching to sanity because these people also print money out of thin air and the entire computer systems that you know, uh, simulates the stock market, I have to say, and our currencies um, is also printing money for them. You know? So um, we have to, basically, we have to do all these three things at the same time. And this is what I mean, we have to kind of, as we're crashing with this Boeing, we have to build a new plane because the engines stopped working, you know? And it kind of yes, and, and Catherine, I wanted to, sorry, I was doing this a little bit earlier, but I wanted to show everybody the cover of this book, if you can see it. And it's really the CIA as Organized Crime by um, Douglas Valentine. How illegal operations corrupt America and the world. And we know this, right? We know this about the intelligence agencies, particularly the CIA. So <clears throat> literally, when you're looking at organized crime, you're going to the heart of the problem. You are looking at the intelligence agencies. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that people have been forbidden or kept from doing for decades by this whole mythos of fear that, and terror that they have surrounded themselves with these intelligence agencies that are engaging in these covert and clandestine ops. And we should know, we are the targets of their covert and clandestine ops at this point in time. And it's time for us to break that mythos entirely, you know, to break through that barrier and to stand up to them and expose them and challenge them openly, publicly, dispute their hold over the world and completely reveal their evil misdeeds. So, you know, I couldn't resist throwing it in there. I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, some of the actions that we can do, you know, to take, to, to take legal action and to stand up against what's being done to us. Um, and, you know, as you say, you've been pushing the affidavit that we're all going to be working on together for quite a while. And you um, are, you know, are really a role model to us for um, putting us in the path of taking legal action, because many people are very afraid of taking legal action. On the one hand, it's so expensive, you have to find a lawyer, and nobody can find a lawyer to represent them. Right? And then there's all these issues with the legal system, the court system, the corruption, etc. I wanted to just say a couple of things about podcasts that I've done lately. I just recently did a podcast with Seven from Solutionaries Media Network over in the UK. And this was just done, I think, Wednesday night. So I haven't yet produced it and I haven't yet posted it and I will shortly. But one of the things she talked about in that podcast was a case that she's bringing an association that has been pretty much targeting her. And, you know, she kind of showed me everything. She did this online, so you can see it in the podcast when it comes out. She showed the document, the actual claim that she filed, and some of the information in that document. 
in terms of legal instruction, you know, because she didn't hear back after she filed a claim. And then, you know, there's a default judgment, you see, and then you file something else uh, immediately after if they don't respond within a given period of time. So she takes us through that whole process. So I think it's very helpful to, to look at something like that. So I think her podcast is going to be very helpful in, in terms of educating us and uh, as to how to go about filing a claim. And also, those two podcasts that we did together, if you recall, um, Catherine, the, the roundtable discussion we had with John Christiana, who's gone so far along in the process of filing a, a claim. And, you know, all of the information that he gave us and also the separate podcast I did with him on similar subjects. So I think um, for us who are being attacked, assaulted, victimized, and targeted with stealth radiation weaponry, which we cannot prove openly, which these guys at the fusion centers, the police departments will not own up to even the horrific weapons on us, weapons and technologies on us. For us, we need to ex explore all options, all ways in which we can publicly and legally declare what we know and demand that they stop what they're doing, right? So along those lines, there's that, the whole court action. The other thing I wanted to mention was, um, you know, um, the in-power movement. And you may know, again, I podcasted there with Josh Del Sol and Cal Washington of the in-power movement. Um, now, these are guys, um, Josh Del Sol made a documentary on smart meters. And he got very interested in trying to figure out how to stop smart meter rollouts. And um, Cal Washington got very interested in trying to figure out the legal system and the entire system of contracts law or merchant law or admiralty law that we, we apparently are stuck inside and uh, trying to figure out how you can operate within that system to, to challenge and stop people who are, you know, non-consensually uh, sticking smart meters on your home that are causing fires to break out and houses to burn up and things like that. Um, so, and, and their hope really is to start with smart meters and then roll out this stream of liability action, which they have come up with, to every other non-consensual invasion that we are being faced with in our current totalitarian states. Um, things like, you know, how to say no to cell towers being set up right next to you, how to say no to 5G being rolled out. And in our case, I think that would be how to say no to people happily um, opening up portable and directed energy weapons and cell tower weapons and uh, directing pulsed microwave radiation at you. So, what's going is something called a notice of liability. And they believe in giving this notice of liability by first identifying individuals and corporations, and these are public utilities, you know, places like Verizon and Comcast or whoever is involved, um, individuals and corporations who would be responsible. And I would imagine those would be the figurehead types, right? The guys at the top, the guys with the most visibility because they are the ones who are supposedly responsible for their company. So you find those individuals and you can't hold the corporation liable, but you can hold these individuals in these corporations liable with this notice of liability. And you accompany it with an affidavit where you spell out very clearly in what way you have been harmed by this thing that you are speaking out against. Spell it out very clearly and submit the affidavit, which is notarized. Um, you know, you're using the, the, the system really, but you're using the system against itself. So you take your affidavit and you take the notice of liability and you hand it to this guy, you serve this guy with it, and um, they can't rebut it um, if it's true. And if they cannot rebut your affidavit, then apparently your claim stands. It's sort of similar to filing a claim in court. And then um, you can file a notice of default if they don't come back and do anything about it, you know, because you hold them liable and you demand a certain amount of money, et cetera, as, uh, you know, for them to redress whatever they've done to you. So but all of this information is spelled out very clearly on their website. They're running a documentary series and they've got episode one and two, I think, um, describing both the notice of liability and now the notice of default with document templates. So, you know, I just wanted to mention that and um, suggest that people go and check it out for themselves, you know, see what they think and see if that's something that would be viable in this case.
because we absolutely have to all start taking public action. You know, the victim mentality is to sit back and say, oh, you can't report it at the police station because they're going to take you off to a psych ward. Hello, these guys are actually using these weapons and they've got psychiatry as a strategy, which is another weapon. So, you know, we do not give in to this incredible weaponology being directed against us. We simply stand up as normal citizens and normal civil civilians with basic rights, basic civil rights and basic human rights. And we look around for ways in which to publicly and legally and completely challenge this, this incredible assault, these incredible crimes that are being committed against us. So it's empowermovement. Um, let me see, I'm just going to look at my browser. Well, actually, maybe I can share my browser very briefly and show it to you. Um, here we go. So this is the empowermovement.com website. It's, um, they've got their Empower docuseries right there with episode number one, A Mass Action of Liability. And um, if you go further down, I guess they put it on DVDs as well. You can stream it, you can watch it on YouTube. It's all free is what I was told. Um, by Josh. And um, then, you know, I guess they've got links here to move on to episode two, or maybe you watch one first. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side, they're rolling out a whole bunch of options. Um, smart meters, mandatory unsafe vaccinations, 5G deployments, and other. I think their hope is to create a kind of system of action that anybody can uh, look at and use for their own particular situations. So, and oh look, 8th November 2017, round three documents added. And if you see right on top, document templates, um, podcast, etc. So, you know, I can't recommend it strongly enough. I think it's incredibly fabulous what they're doing. And um, it, it needs a little bit of um, time and uh, research time, you know, sit down and read those documents uh, figure it out for yourself, figure out, um, watch their episodes. Um, their episode one is very clear, actually. It kind of spells out the whole contract law system and how one can enter it, can wade into it and um, still take action. So, um, you know, spend some time doing that. And uh, I think it's really empowering. I need to go back and really look at all this information all over again so I can, I, I, I personally am very interested in this action of liability and I want to start handing out notices of liability all over Quincy and Massachusetts shortly. So that's my plan. Yes, and I think also the, um, also the um, sorry, I think I'm getting feedback, but um, the, the um, what, what's also I think is a good idea is um, to hand out these notices of liability, not just to um, the officials, but also to the neighbors who have, um, who are complicit in, in uh, attempted murder. Um, I think, because I think all of us have the experiences that um, experience that we are being machine gunned from neighbors or being assaulted with. Um, yes. you know, and, I, and I think that is a power action, actually, um, Catherine, because think about it at the moment that we actually confront our neighbors and we hand these notices of liability to them. You know, that is a power action. Um, up to this point, and we should probably make a note of it, various people in our groups, and I would venture to say the infiltrators and the agents in our groups, have taken care to, to suppress, repress, and oppress people among, among us who, who so much as mention that neighbors are doing this to us. And we are constantly cautioned, do not approach the neighbors, do not say this to the neighbors, do not accuse the neighbors, do not do anything. You can be sectioned, you, you know, you are wrong, you cannot prove it, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and this is perhaps a, a segue, Catherine, to um, talking a little bit about the technicalities of how you can indeed prove that uh, you're getting pulse microwave shots or whatever from the direction of the neighbor's house. And I have that experience where um, my meters showed the um, direction of some of these weapons and God bless one of the dogs that I have. She was a hundred percent reliable when they started um, upping the um, directed energy weapons at me in Florida. She was a hundred percent reliable in barking at the direction of where these uh, emanations were coming from. And I would take the meter out and go to all areas of the, of the yard and every single time, the high reading was coming from the direction this dog was facing. 
And this is one of the reasons I know it was coming from one of the neighbors to the, to the side from her sunroom and then from the man who attacked me and knew it was coming from his car because she barked in his direction. I took the meter to the fence. Lo and behold, the meter was going wild as where it wasn't necessarily going wild anywhere else. So my brother actually took the meter to the, uh, to the neighbor's property and he stood in front of the car that we suspected was doing it. And the meter, instead of going from, and it was an electromagnetic meter, uh, so instead of going from, uh, oscillating from about 180 or so up to over 9,000 all the time, okay, that's what it was doing. When he took it and went to the front of the car that we thought was powering the, the directed energy weapon, it went to above 9,000 kilohertz and stayed. Okay, that pretty much proved it. And he said to me, he said, Karen, I could only stand in front of the car engine for about 10, 20 seconds because I was getting lightheaded and nauseated. And he took the meter and went to the other neighbor's sunroom, stood at the door, same thing. The meter stopped oscillating under 9,000 kilohertz and only oscillated at 9,000 and above and he said I could only stay there a few seconds because otherwise I thought I would pass out and or get sick. The meters will tell you, you know, and sometimes the dog will tell you. In fact, I had neighbors when I was telling them about the directed energy weapon, they said, oh, for Pete's sake, she, and one of the neighbors said, our dog will refuse to walk near that neighbor's house. And we try to walk her past that, the street, uh, past that house, and the dog, God bless her, basically puts her paws on the street and refuses to go in that direction. Something strange was going on there because the dog didn't have a problem in the daytime, but in the nighttime when you say that it's being ratcheted up really horribly, the dog wouldn't go there. And one of the neighbors said, yeah, I'm hearing high-pitched whining in that area, and now I know why the dog won't go there. So there are ways to tell. There are indications. You look for patterns of behavior, but your meters and sometimes your animals will tell you. So it is the neighbors a lot of the time. And the people say, oh, no, you're just imagining it. I would be very suspicious of them. Actually, there's one thing I would like to um, show you on that topic. Um, so, um, um, two things actually, um, talking about the neighbors, hang on, um, so if I may just share my screen, I have tweeted, um, something and, and by the way, what I wanted to say earlier when I was, I started banging on about information warfare is that in this war, they will, they have an internet kill switch, but as long as they don't kill the internet, we have to use it, but they are doing other warfare techniques. For example, something called shadow banning and information warfare on, on Twitter and Facebook and many other places. But the way around this, and this is something I put into place, um, just last week is I number my tweets now so that if my tweets disappear, people can go to my street stream directly. And it should be a, a you know, a, a clean sequence of numbers. Um, you know, sometimes I screw up the numbering, but, um, you know, it, it should be all be there. I think up until now I managed to have a clean sequence and you can check every tweet and every single time I tweet information, it should be there. So, and I had to change to numbered tweets exactly because there was so much shadow banning. And one of the things I know for sure is that my tweets do not get broadcast to my followers. And people have told me that they discovered that they were unfollowed. So defollowed. The intel agencies, I think if I were, you know, um, malicious, what I would do is I would go through all the followers and, and snip the links to the people with most followers in turn, you know. Because if they retweet something, they would um, reach a lot of people. So if you have a lot of followers and you started following me, please check that you still do. Um, but either way, what you have to do is manually go to my Twitter um, stream, to my Twitter page, and go through all the um, tweets. And I say that because I started tweeting some very important information. And one of the things I would like to show that I tweeted um, last week is um, documents that um, were publicized by um, Dr. Ronnie Kilder. Um, who was the chief medical officer of Finland before she was murdered in 2015. And um, she, uh, so she was murdered by the intelligence agencies using directed energy weapons. But um, she uh, gave a talk and it's, um, it's an interview, a filmed interview, and you will find it on, um, let me zoom in. 
So you will find it on uh, on YouTube yourself. Sorry, here it's called Basis Five HD Ronnie Kilder Part One. And um, if you go there to one hour, one minute and 25 seconds, you, you will see this document shown by um, Dr. Ronnie Kilder. And what this is, is um, this is from her talk that she gave at the 33rd International Conference for Military Medicine in Helsinki. This was an international conference of very high profile people. And she is presenting here, I think, the slide that she wanted to show, which is this integrated weapon system. And um, first of all, here at the top, you will see that it shows um, the U U.S. National Security Agency here working together with GCHQ, uh, Military Intelligence, MI5, and the Ministry of Defense in this satellite um, cell tower system that eventually is also, also hitting individuals. This is an integrated weapon system, guys, not just surveillance. It's a weapon system. OK, it can kill. That's the whole point. Um, and then further down, you will see, and this is why I bring it up, all the different methods outlined where people can be targeted individually. And you will see in her diagram here, let me make it a bit bigger. I hope I can show you that these cell towers are hitting individuals and not others. Okay. And one person can be hit by two cell towers. This is also what um, Dr. Barry Tra, the microwave weapon expert um, in the UK is saying. He's saying that people can be targeted by one cell tower, two cell towers. So as you're walking along the street, you're within the um, reach of one tower. And as you turn the corner, you're within the reach of, of another. Okay. And when you get a person shot at by two, you can imagine that this person gets whacked by double the intensity. So this guy would die, but not this guy and not that guy. Yes, get the system. But Dr. Ronnie Kilda also blew the whistle on, for example, big vans being parked outside cars and shooting at people inside their home in a targeted fashion. And then, and this I highlighted this in my tweet and read, also neighbors putting down these devices and shooting at you in your home in a targeted fashion. Okay, these were already known military strategies that Dr. Ronnie Kilda blew the whistle on. Okay, because she wasn't one of the bad guys. She gave, went to this conference to actually blow the whistle on this stuff, yes? Okay, so she was a medical doctor actually concerned for people's welfare. And this is the stuff that she heard about because also she was very highly regarded and very well trusted, you know? And people have told me that generals trusted her, you know? And so she had access to a lot of information, but she blew the whistle on this, that you can be hit by a neighbor specifically and the person standing next to you will not be hit or the person below won't be hit now this is exactly the setup in my home yes i'm being hit here and people sometimes standing next to me are not hit and in the video that you see just imagine a little metal bunker around me and then people machine gun me from next door and you can hear the shots and when they come through the gaps they bounce bounce around the, the walls which are reflecting because they're metal okay so that's that. But also look at the other disclosure. There's also a diagram where people can be shot at from helicopters here. And need shots to the head. But they can also be shot at. And look at this diagram. This person gets shot through one, two, three walls. You know, a ceiling, a floor, and the roof. So you can be hit through several walls. Okay, so this is the disclosure. Please go and listen to this talk by Dr. Ronnie Kilder. And also, um, I would like to say one thing. That talk is very interesting indeed, because um, she is also, um, she reveals a lot about her, her life. Um, she talks about how she was targeted. In the interview, when the journalists are there, perps are coming to her house and putting post in her um, post box on a Sunday, you know, this, and this is post delivered by the postman. So it shows that her mail was intercepted by neighbors and neighbors popped out and perped her, you know. So the neighbors were Nazis and also accessories to the murder of Dr. Roni Kilder. Um, a very small Norwegian community. So I think we'll find out who those people were. She also talks about, um, you know, MSCDs and the foreign cars coming to her community and driving up and down the street and all that. But she also talks about a lot of stuff. And I would like to say one, two things about Dr. Ronnie Kilder because she's so important. Um, 
She also talks about, I mean, Dr. Onikilda, I think she, since she was a teenager, she was just fascinated by, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, like um, space travel. And also she was musing about are there aliens or not and so on. And you have to know that the intelligence agencies profile absolutely everybody, I would say pretty much from, you know, primary school or childhood if they can. And then they will um, try to hook in with your pe personal beliefs, um, you know, preferences and so on. And um, Dr. Onikilda talks about a lot of experiences that she had in looking at her testimony. My experience, my, my impression is that she might also have been perped by the intelligence agencies who have exposed her to things like remote neural monitoring, synthetic telepathy, and biorobotization, and then made it look like it's something spiritual or supernatural. That's my personal um, take. She, for example, in that interview talks about how she attended um, a group where, um, which was trying to um, somehow, you know, um, see if there's any supernatural powers the human brain might have or any extraordinary powers that you might have. And at some point she describes that she had what is called um, uh, auto writing, I think, when suddenly your arm starts um, moving by itself and drawing into the end. She describes that vividly. And what people typically um, do is discard everything that she says because she talks about, oh, she's talking about the supernatural stuff, so she must be cuckoo. No, guys, it's the other way around. She's saying the truth because all throughout it shows that she was targeted by the intelligence agencies with this sophisticated technology. So, this, what she describes, this automatic writing can actually be done you know, um, with biorobotization. And I would say that Dr. Onikilda was uh, a victim of biorobotization and the intelligence agencies used her beliefs or hopes or wishes or, you know, past experience to trick her into thinking that this was something, you know, something else. But I actually think she was a victim of the intelligence agencies already at the time. Now, this is very important for the investigation because all these little um, indicators show us, you know, how the intelligence agencies have been operating. And by the way, guys, I am aware that a lot of intel agents are also tricked into this to believe that they are aliens and they live among us and so on. And also that there are some of these super like godlike people who are chosen. And I have to tell you, this is a ruse. It's a ruse by the intelligence agencies themselves, which they play on their own people. Okay. And this is very important for everybody who's listening because there are people out there who have been uh, pretty much brought up in a fantasy world. There are people who've been brought up on military bases and in underground bunkers. Some of them have, you know, advanced technology in them. Um, some of them have d had horrific stuff done to them and have, you know, alters in them. So parts of their personality are compartmentalized. But I have to tell you that the intelligence agencies will try to use you, whoever you are. You could be the head of MI6, by the way. The intel agencies or the cartel will try to use you and will use your weaknesses and your beliefs and they will try to bullshit you. And actually, the higher up you are, the more you will be bullshitted. Um, so I'm just saying these things for everybody who maybe experienced automatic uh, writing or any other spiritual experiences, please sit down, go into yourself and have a hard think if maybe you have become the victim of advanced technology. And, um, you know, if so, the second question should be where you abused as a child, maybe, because if you have any recollection of that, um, you know, it's a very important thing because if you're somebody who is perhaps high up or in a key position, um, I would say you're very likely were abused as a child. You only reached that position because you have some sort of vulnerability in you. Um, and this could maybe be, a, you know, another personality programmed into you that you're not even aware exists. Now, I say this because um, as a system analyst, I would say that as we're hitting this, this, this what I call the nonlinearity in the system, you know, as the plane keeps diving and we're getting closer and ever more desperate, um, I think people will be set off in amongst us who have, you know, and also high up in the establishment who um, can sometimes behave in a totally different way without actually being aware of this. Okay. I'm talking about MK Ultra and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to say all this as a by the by, because it's, it's, it's pretty important people. Otherwise I wouldn't go on this tangent. So all that we have to find all the people with altars in them, all the people of MK Ultra. We really have to find them fast because I also anticipate that at some point they will be made to turn on their own families or people around them. And I think they will also be made to turn on people within the establishment who are trying to stop the crime cartel. Okay. And if you read the news carefully um, or have done over the last couple of years, I think there's ample evidence of that already 
having happened. So, but that aside, I want to get back to Karen's point that we are being attacked by the neighbors and that has been already in military documents and has already been published at a military medicine conference in 2010. Okay, so 17 years ago. Now this since then has been put into practice and Karen, Ramola, um, Millicent, Melanie and I, we are all being attacked from our neighbors. Okay, and as, as um, uh, Ramola said, all of these people need to be sent notices of liability because they are accessories to murder and they're complicit. Um, so I, I want to say that. So, um, and I think we really want to get started with this. So our plan is um, certainly to put out letters that you can send around to the people who are um, responsible for, the, for our targeting. Add your name to that because we also want to stop your targeting. So this is one of the things we're doing. Then you should also um, learn about um, these notices of liability and what they actually are because everybody who is um, taking part in, the muti in your mutilation and your you know, attempted murder um, is, is, is liable, you know, and we will hold them accountable. And I tell you that what these people fear most is, um, first of all, exposure, right? But second of all, it's um, also long-term damage to their um, reputation because it, it limits their possibilities. But what they absolutely fear the most is um, financial repercussions, okay? So anything that damages their power or their finances um, you know, is very, very, they will take that seriously. And this is why, um, you know, um, putting the, the, the uh, costs and damages, you know, um, on the doormat of these companies freaks them out because suddenly, um, you know, it's, it will cut into their, into their profit margins, you know, and maybe even their, their personal income. So that's one thing. And then I just would like to say one more thing about court cases because they are, I mean, as I keep saying, I think they are the last stop before all out civil war. Okay. So I am I'm really for court cases. Um, but I um, also would like to say that um, what has happened to the court system over the last decades, if not centuries, is that it has also been captured. And you are right that going to court is extremely expensive. And my question is, why? Why is it so prohibited, prohibited to, to go to court and try to defend your own life? How can it be uh, prohibitively expensive that you're prohibited from defending your own life? Because we're all fighting for our life here, guys. And, and we are not even daring to ask that these people stop because we're scared that, you know, if we survive, we'll be, we'll be bankrupted. So what that shows you is the scale of capture in the judicial system. And I would like to briefly point you to something because we feel that capture for sure, the, the, the litigants, the, the people who you know, um, need to approach the courts. We are, you know, as one judge put it, we are court users. You know? Where, yeah, we, we have to use these systems. These are our systems in our civil society and we have to be able to use them. So if you can't use them, they might as well not be there. So I would say that what we have right now is no justice. The justice system doesn't exist. There's, there's a stage managed show, but it doesn't exist. So um, the first problem is that it's so expensive. But secondly, do you think it's normal that you need somebody else to talk for you to explain the case. I mean, where else do we have that? You know, your medical issues are complex. Nevertheless, you're perfectly qualified to go to a doctor, tell them what the problem is, and sort it out with him. You don't need to hire somebody really expensive who really understands your medical case, takes your description of your symptoms from you, puts it into, you know, folders this big, and then goes to the doctor and then, you know, sorts your case out with him. Why? But I would, I would argue that your biological system is much more complex than the law. Nevertheless, you're perfectly capable of going and talking to a doctor directly. But when it comes to the court, you can't go and talk to a judge directly and explain to him what happened? How, how come? Could it be that there's some big fat cartel hidden somewhere that's creating a bottleneck to, to get as much money off people as possible? So I personally think that the legal profession, if it even exists, it implies deep capture, okay? So if we want to get to a saner world, we have to get rid of the legal profession. And if the laws are so complex that we need somebody to de devote an entire career to understanding them, then we need to get rid of those laws. I think this is how it is. Um, 
And I've got one thing I would like to share with you because it's not just the court users or the litigants who are, who are complaining about this. I would like to point you, I do like to quote these Supreme Court judges in the UK because, you know, they do say important stuff. I would like to point you to this talk, which you will find on YouTube, and it's by Lord Toulson, who's since retired, um, and it's called Good Law. Okay, the title of the talk is Good Law, A Judicial Perspective. Now, it was given on 30th of June 2014, and you'll find this video here by the Supreme Court. By the way, I can't help noticing the 666 in here, the Omega and the Crown for the Crown Corporation. But anyway, try to uh, ignore that. And then if you go into the talk, um, you will see here the, the Supreme Court. And then um, Lord Toulson is giving a speech. And what he actually says in the speech, it's one hour long, and please listen to it. Um, because he also explains how the law has gone has grown so complex that there are areas of the law where not even the the lawyers and the judge can figure out what the law actually says. Okay, now that is not a normal situation. And if you had to guess where the situation arises, I mean, at first you might think, oh, it's probably in commercial law because that's really complex, you know. But guess what? No, it's about um, the, the social insurance. So the laws put, for some reason, the laws put out, you know, by parliament and, and the, this entire architecture of secondary legislation has grown so complex that people who are entitled to receive benefits from the state, the legal situation is so complex that no one can figure out what benefits they're entitled to. Does that sound like a coincidence to anybody? <laughs> so You need us to tell you what you can get. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So this situation is not normal, guys. It so is normal. Right. And when you listen to these and this is a, this is a Supreme Court judge. OK, I even made it. I, I used to have a website for my company before my time, you know, my attempts to start a company were taken down. And this was as it was a company specializing in systems analysis. But I had this as a maybe I should put it up again as a case study of what happened to the law. And you can think about what happened systemically that we ended up in the state. But either way, this has to go. And what. It's really important for us to realize this because as we're hitting the court, we will hit all these barriers. Number one, people will tell you, you need to buy, you know, some high powered attorney to, to even just protect your life in court. Oh, the court is, uh, the law is so complex that without, you know, professional help, you won't get anywhere. Now, I say we have to go the other direction. We have to take all this blaming cartel, shift it to one side and go back to basics. That's what you do in physics when you, when you have a complex problem. You, you make it as simple as possible and you build it up from there. I would say, actually, our cases aren't complex at all. Our cases are really simple. Yes, it involves advanced technology, but at core, it involves something really, really simple. We're going to the court and we're asking not to be murdered by the state. It's that simple. And we have seen many examples of this, right? We have seen examples of this in, in East Germany, and we have seen examples of this in Nazi Germany and all around the world. And frankly, the answer is rather simple. So if somebody, a normal person, can't go into the court and in a situation that we're now, we're being machine gunned to death in our own home, in our own beds, right, with advanced technology, and we've got technology put into us that's being used to torture us 24-7. If we can't, ourselves go into a court argue our cases get it across to a judge and be given right then i think we have to burn the courthouses down and start from scratch because it doesn't get any more clear cut like than that this you know at the end of the day these cases aren't complex it's something very simple of course yes there's this big complex architecture but i think what we have to work towards is figure out what exactly is going on, put all the evidence together in one heap, and then you know, use each other's cases to cross-reference, to get, get it across to a judge that, A, this is a global program. The program looks pretty much identical across the world. Because it's identical across the world, you can compare victim cases, not, not just within one jurisdiction, but across many jurisdictions as far as the evidence is concerned. Um, and at the end of the day, it goes to the very core of our judicial system. Do we have the laws into place that prevent one person from going out and killing another at will? You know, I think this is what it is. 
Um, there's slight complications because as we're approaching the court system, we're approaching a system that's in deep capture. It has been captured by organized crime. But again, the question is very simple. If the entire world, you know, if, as these victims are going into the courtroom, can we get enough people to go with them, sit in the public gallery like they used to do in the olden days and watch the court case? And can we all ensure that the judge behaves like a judge should? Can we do that? Can we pull it off as a society? And can we take these very simple cases of people being murdered in their own home and can we ensure that they get justice because i say if we can't do that okay then i think we deserve to die as a species because let's face it we're killing all other species on this planet right that's the, that's the truth we're spraying all the shit uh, we are killing stuff. And by the way, the father of Melanie Richan made a very good point. We were driving to the hospital to um, visit Melanie and he was in the car with me. And at some point, just out of the blue, he said, you know, it's so strange in the olden days when you used to drive on the motorway, even for the shortest distance, you used to arrive and your entire windshield used to be just covered with dead bugs that just, you know, whacked up against the windscreen. Now all the bugs are gone. You can drive for thousands of kilometers and there won't be a single beetle or bug or gnat splattered on your windscreen and it was such a simple sentence and then he went silent and i almost crashed into the car that had stopped at the red light because i just thought wow it's so simple and it's so deep it has been in front of our eyes all the time and we didn't see it this people is the planet dying and the beetles and these gnats dying is really bad news because if we plot the number of you know members of a species we are basically like you know it's like a big ex dropping exponential and we're somewhere like so far out that we're basically negligible and the real big peak is towards the the creepy crawlies the beetles you know the ants and all that the flies and then the bacteria and so on okay there is a lot of them and there are very few of us. So when the things that there should be a lot of are dying, wherever you drive with a car, it means that this entire, because if you turn it around, the complex species are standing on a massive pyramid above the, the really you know, simple creatures. Now, if you remove them, it's like removing a support structure from a building. It will go down. All right. So what I'm saying is that all this technology and all the stuff that we've been pumping out and also the stuff that's being pumped out by the airplanes, there's a lot of things for military purposes and mind control purposes, but does a lot of damaging things to all the other species that we need to survive. So guys, if we can't figure this out, I say we deserve to die. Yeah. For this reason. But I mean, obviously, I don't want to die, but that's that is it. So I'm, I'm saying this as a wake up call. Compared to the real problems, and this is what I said in my own talks a long time ago, the real issue here is the ecosystems collapsing. Okay, the fact that we can drive from literally um, Helsinki all the way to Rome and have maybe three bugs splattered on our windscreen, that's the real problem, right? This is pretty, pretty crazy because we can't actually make those bugs come back like that and, and repair the ecosystems. Those are the real problems. That's, those are the real problems with our engine, guys, with the engines as we're on this Boeing 747 going like this. Now, those are hard problems to solve. And then there are comparatively easy problems to solve, which is how the F make a judge not be corrupt when 50 people are watching. All right? People managed to do that in the 19th century. Can we do it now? with Twitter and all this stuff. <laughs> I think this is what it comes down to. You know, we are dealing actually at core, we're dealing with piss easy questions, right? There's actually one guy, and maybe one day in my memoirs, I'll write the full story, but I actually asked a very high powered um, lawyer for help. And he sent a message back. I got the best message back. I'm not sure it was his message, but a message was brought back to me by Intel. And it said, do it yourself. And I was like, fucking asshole. That was my first reaction. I was like, thanks. Thanks, mate. Yeah, the, the time I needed help the most, this is what I get. And then I thought, hmm, yeah, you do it yourself. It's the best advice ever. Of course, do it yourself because the entire system is fucked. It's so corrupt. If you don't, if, if you don't do it yourself, you will end up with everything but justice. Okay. 
So I want every single one of us now to sit down and think, what does justice look like? What do I expect when I go into a court? How would I argue my own case? And this is as simple as it gets, guys, as far as legal cases are concerned. And can I just sit down between now and maybe a couple of weeks before Christmas, put together my evidence for the abuse I've suffered, argue on really fundamental, basic legal principles why I should be given right and the people who tried to kill me, you know, should be put away in jail? And, and could we possibly support each other, watch each other's court cases, maybe help each other financially or time-wise or campaigning-wise or in any other way? And could we possibly pull it off? And I say, I think we can. It doesn't sound that hard if you phrase it, phrase it like that. You know? And if we can't, I'm telling you guys, you're fucked. All right? So <laughs> you're with me? <laughs> Any, everybody in the chat who's with me, please say I. <laughs> and I think we also support each other, Catherine, by writing letters of reference other you know so that campaign uh, letter campaign that you talked about earlier i think is something we should get cracking on so just set it up on our websites and just ask people to going forward and write letters of reference for us and i guess list in each person's case who to um send these letters to and we had talked about before that we would like anybody who does take the time and makes the effort to copy us and not only does that tell us basically what is being done but for future reference we can point back and say look Susie Smith over here five months ago wrote a letter saying not only do we want to not only do I want uh, this person to be helped but I am a victim too and this shows proof where we can stand with that person and say, yes, Susie Smith is a targeted individual for when we go to settlement and say, we need settlement for this person, this person, this person, this person. Now, you know, anytime that this breaks, people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, oh yeah, uh, uh, I was a targeted person too. No, there's no history of it, you know? So people need to get involved now and put your footstep here where you can prove you were involved and that you were saying before this broke open that you had been targeted for a year or 15 years or 40 years. So get involved because that helps you as well as us. And it shows that you have standing in any court case that uh, goes through. So again, it tells us what is being done. We can see that, oh, gee, look at this attorney general. You know, she got a hundred emails. You know, there's no excuse for her to say, no, I'm just here to look pretty, you know. Um, but then these hundred people say, yeah, I was aware of this and helping a year ago, three months ago. You know, not just a Johnny come lately. So it serves your purpose and ours to do this. So remember to, to copy us when you do something like this. And we will try as much as possible to give you templates. And the template is a guideline, a suggestion. You don't have to use the template. But if you're not comfortable writing, use the template. You know, we're more than happy to help you with that. You know, add to it, take from it. Nobody cares, you know. As long as it's true, it's valid, it's your opinion. Okay? So, again, for your own sake, step up. Yes, and actually, very good point, Karen. You reminded me of a couple of things I wanted to say, which is also, um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm also painfully aware that what the intel agencies engage in is the disappearance of evidence. So the computers get hacked. Um, I had evidence deleted from my computers. External hard drives were um, demolished remotely, um, you know, corrupted such that I couldn't access data, and, 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 and. So one of the things, um, so of course, uh, the, the natural thing when you get attacked by the intel agencies is to think, oh my God, I want to go private. I want to encrypt everything, keep it hidden. The problem with that is that if you create a little island, somebody just has to come and take it from there and there's no other copy. And by now, I'm probably the most hacked person on the planet. My brain is hacked. Absolutely everything is hacked. 
I say go the opposite way and I say smear it across cyberspace, all your evidence, wherever you can. And if you think, oh, but if I do that, the intel agencies will kill me because they will see what I have. I tell you, they already know what you have because they did it yourself and they can access your computers at any time. But what you really want is to have multiple copies. So I always say, you know, email your evidence, photographs. If you have video and audio, just put it on a Dropbox, put it on an external hard drive, on your computers, put it absolutely everywhere. And trust the fact that there are so many thousands of people now coming forward with really hard hitting evidence implicating, you know, attorney generals, military leaders of all sorts, these people will not have the time. I mean, everybody's, it's up to everybody to, to make this judgment call of, you know, what they consider risk and whatnot. But um, I basically, I've, I've reached the conclusion that the best thing is to, to just spread your, your evidence absolutely around. And this is not necessarily um, an advice that lawyers would give you, but lawyers are also, um, I think, hopelessly oblivious to, to the extent of the, of the invasion we are facing from the intel agencies. You know, if you put stuff in your, in your safe, they can crack the safe. If you keep stuff in your home, they can come in and take it away. For example, logbooks are a really good thing to keep about your abuse. Because in your handwriting that can't be falsified over a period of time, you write down what has been done to you. That's a really good thing to do. But also, I would say keep a digital copy in case somebody steals the logbook because the digital copy you can um, duplicate very, very fast. You can put it on, you know, Dropbox, external hard drives and so on. So this is... Um, this is very, very important. And the other thing is also about leaving a fingerprint because um, I, I, I don't want to kill anybody um, because people are trying to kill us. And there are others in our situation who, I mean, I think we all had assassination attempts and I, they might have some. Um, but nevertheless, if you have um, smeared your data around, people can later on go through the databases and reconstruct what happened. And the more people know about this, the better. And right now we can't um, access the data at the NSA because the criminals seem to have it. But one day, you know, the good guys will be back in charge of the NSA and then, hey, we'll have all the data and actually running a criminal investigation. When it's about crimes against humanity, you can access these databases and then we can find the criminals very, very fast.